In this video, I'm gonna talk about four sleeper spec books that I'm super bullish on. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another video with Swaggle Haas. And in this video, I got four sleeper spec books that I'm gonna talk about. That's right, it's a sleeper spec books with Swaggle Haas video. And I'm very, very excited about this one because I've gone full Pepe Silvia over here, digging into Marvel Unlimited, reading about this stuff and trying to connect dots. Uh, I'm absolutely going crazy. This whole box is Pepe Silvia! But before I get into the books for today, if you guys could drop me a like or comment or subscribe if you're enjoying the content, help support the channel, do one of those things, and I would appreciate it. All right, that said, let us get into the picks here today. And, you know, of course, guys, with all speculation, use discretion when you guys are getting this stuff. Uh, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know if this is going to come to fruition, but these are books that I'm very, very bullish on. And overall, I think that these are books that are very, very affordable. I picked ones that, you know, typically speaking, you can find these on eBay for probably under $10. Maybe if you're in an LCS, you can find them for five. I mean, I've certainly found a few of these myself uh, for very low amounts. So I feel like low risk, high reward. Why not? All right, well, let's get into my first pick here. My first pick is actually going to be Thor Annual Number 10 from 1982. And what is the significance of this? Well, there's quite a few things here. Number one, this is the first appearance of Demigorge the God Eater, otherwise known as Adam. This is the first appearance of Demiurge, creator of life on Earth. This is the first appearance of Apollo, God of Light, post-Golden Age. We'll table that for a minute and let me explain the other stuff. Uh, arguably, this is the first appearances of Chathon and Set in their true form. I will also uh, talk about that in a second. This is also the origin of Earth in Marvel. This is how life was created in all of Marvel comic books on Earth. And then the last thing here, this is written by Mark Gruenwald. And why do I think that that's significant? Well, if we look at everything that happened with Falcon and Winter Soldier, everything that happened with Loki, and even some things that happened in WandaVision, Marvel has been taking so many plot lines from Mark Gruenwald's comic books uh, from the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. So I feel like there are people over at Marvel Studios who are big fans of Mark Gruenwald. So anytime I come across his books, uh, I pay extra attention to, to them because I think that, you know, the people over there are following his lead on storylines and he's just an amazing writer. I mean, everything that he touched, I'm such a big fan of. So this one right here, Thor Annual 10, is another one of those books that he wrote. And again, this is something I think is so interesting because this is the origin of Earth. So let's first talk about Demi urge here. Now, Demi-Urge is the uh, first entity ever to be like sort of born around Earth. And then it was like this energy of light that seeded the planet and gave birth to life. And the entities that it birthed are things like Chathan, things like Set, and also uh, Gaia, who is, you know, of course, in Norse mythology, like the mother, the mother of Earth, you know. So this is like a super, super important book in terms of like building the lore and the foundation. So now why do I think it's important to, you know, say the MCU or whatever? Well, we already have the Darkhold in the MCU, and everybody knows that that book was written by Chathan. Well, who created Chathan? It's actually Demiurge here. And then how did Chathan get banished to this other plane? Well, he was chased off by Demigorge, who is the son of Gaia and, you know, the, the son of Demiurge itself. So I, I can tell that I have already lost you guys here. This whole box is Pepe Sylvia! But needless to say, this is super, super important world building. If we're gonna get the history of Chathan and having him write the Darkhold, uh, then I actually think that they're gonna have to look at this book and we might start to see some of the crazy things like Demiurge and Demigorge, et cetera, et cetera. Now let's talk about this footnote that I have where it says, arguable first appearances of Chathan and Set's true form. Now, I know what you guys are thinking. You guys are thinking, hey, Chathan's first appearance is in Marvel Chillers number one next to Modred the Mystic. And what I would say to you is that if that's Chathan's first appearance as a giant smoke creature, then Fantastic Four, Rise of the Silver Surfer did Galactus perfectly as a giant smoke creature. So I don't know. To me, I don't feel like that's his actual first appearance, knowing what he actually looks like. Uh, so I would actually table that as being, you know, an, an incantation of some kind of the Chathan demon. Now, we also have the appearances in the Avengers 186 and 187, where Scarlet Witch was, uh, you know, enslaved by Chathan. I mean, maybe we want to talk about that. There is a panel panel in flashback that sort of has Chathan writing down the dark cult, so that could be his first appearance. But this book right here has this panel right here, which everybody, uh, you know, it references whenever they're doing Marvel lore videos. Maybe you've seen a Comics Explained use this panel before. Uh, this one right here, as you can see, has the actual true form appearances of Chathan, Gaia, 
and set. So I think that this book, regardless, you know, maybe this is not necessarily the first appearance of these characters, but this is the first time we got their origin, what they actually sort of look like uh, at that time. These are like interpretations of that. But regardless, if you want to call it the first true appearance of their actual form, uh, what they actually look like, uh, it, it doesn't really matter. I just think that this is, a, is just an extra added bonus as to why this book is important and why this book has significance to the Marvel Universe. So overall, Thor and Annual number 10, I feel like if we're going to get the history of the Darkhold and we're going to lay the foundation for Chathan, they're going to have to explain this in some kind of way. And these, you know, all connect to the Celestials as well, because the Celestials didn't create life on Earth. They just tampered with life on Earth that was actually created by Demi-Urge. We're going to continue to talk about sleep or spec books in a second. But before we do, let's take a minute to talk about the sponsor of this video, Nine Panel. Now, I recently met these guys. These guys are collectors themselves, and they spent the last four years talking to dealers, vendors, buyers. LCSs all across the nation trying to figure out a better way to buy and sell comic books online. And they created this thing called Nine Panel. And I gotta tell you, I'm a big fan of this. The comics on Nine Panel are actually listed by reputable sellers and LCSs all across the US. It's easy to search for key books or browse by comic specific categories. On Nine Panel, I can buy from as many shops as I want in a single checkout, and all transactions are secure and protected from fraud. If I want to sell books, I can set my own policies and create a custom branded shop page with filter and search features for my buyers, and their smart listing process helps me create better listings in less time. Nine Panel is a marketplace built just for comics by comic collectors who love comic books. So go check out Nine Panel and buy a book today. All right, let's go on now to the next book here. And the next book is actually going to be Thor Annual number 11 from 1983. And what is the significance of this? Well, there's a few things here. One, it's the first appearance of Eitri, who is, of course, the character that Peter Dinklage played in Infinity War, the dwarf who created Mjolnir and St Stormbreaker. Number two, this is the origin of Thor. Now, I know what you guys are thinking. You're thinking, no, the origin of Thor is actually in uh, Journey into Mystery 83 or Journey into Mystery 89. Now, that's kind of true, but not actually true as far as what we know of Thor. Those origins were actually about the Donald Blake version of the origin of Thor. Now, there's also Thor 300, which also goes into Thor's origin. But this one right here, Thor Annual Number 11, this to me is the true origin of Thor as far as like getting the most in-depth version of where he was born, how he was born, what he was like growing up as a kid. This is also, of course, the first appearance of Eitri who created Mjolnir. So you get the origin of Mjolnir being created in this book, which I think is really awesome. And then right there, you see in parentheses, I know you're getting ahead of me, arguable Kid Loki first appearance. All right, we're gonna not talk about that yet, but eventually I will get to it. But let's talk about Eitri here because, and why do I think Eitri is a character who is not done in the MCU? Well, we all know that we have Thor, Love and Thunder coming, right? And we all think that we're going to get Jane Foster Thor, and then we all think that we might even get Beta Ray Bill. Well, currently in the Marvel Universe, there's only one weapon to go amongst all three of those characters. We only have Stormbreaker. Captain America took Mjolnir, went back in time, and returned it to its place. So as far as our timeline is concerned, there's only one weapon that exists for all three of those characters. We also know in the storyline that uh, Jane Foster Thor, one of the ways that she ended up beating cancer was that she had to become worthy. She had to pick up Mjolnir the hammer. Well, we don't have have Mjolnir in our current timeline. So how are they going to rectify this? Well, I would think that they would probably be paying a visit to Eitri and have him make some weapons for this you know, potential Thor corpse that we're going to get. I mean, maybe uh, Eitri is going to make a Mjolnir hammer for Jane Foster and it also make another Mjolnir for Thor. And then Thor can give Stormbreaker to Beta Ray Bill. So overall, I feel like uh, no matter how you slice it, these guys are going to need some weapons uh, in order to battle Gore the God Butcher. And I feel like they're going to have to visit Eitri for that to happen, which makes this book pretty cool in my mind. First appearance of Eitri. Again, not a very, very expensive book. So this is one that I think is really interesting. Already a character who we know exists in Marvel continuity, and I feel like has a good chance to make another appearance. And since I pulled the panel, I wanted to kind of show it to you guys here. There you see Eitri creating Mjolnir for the first time, giving it to Odin, who would then bestow it onto Thor. Now let's also talk about this arguable kid Loki first appearance. Now we all know that Thor 617 got super hot because it was the quote unquote the first appearance of Kid Loki. Well, I'm here to tell you that I don't believe that that's the actual first appearance of Kid Loki. In fact, the actual first appearance of Kid Loki, in my opinion, takes place in Journey into Mystery 100 from 1964. You can see right there in this panel, Thor and Loki playing together as kids on that tree branch right there. I mean, maybe you want to make the argument that this is uh 
preteen Loki or teen Loki. Uh, here's another panel from, from this uh, particular issue here uh, where they're going against these giants. I don't know. I'm not here to make that argument, but let's 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 say that, for instance, you, we we all think that this is the uh, first appearance of Teen Loki. We'll call him Teen Loki as opposed to Kid Loki. Well, that brings me back to this book here, Thor Annual Number Eleven, because this goes through Thor growing up as a kid, as well as like you know him uh, coming into his own, getting Mjolnir, how he was banished to Earth, etc. And so for for me, uh, you can see right there in this panel that is certainly looks like a Kid Loki to me. Of course, this is a book that came out in 1983. Here's another panel for them getting into antics uh, and Thor playing with his brother uh, there battling a snake. So again, I'm not trying to make the argument that this right here, Thor Annual 11, is in fact the first appearance of Kid Loki. But, you know, overall, again, kind of like the last book, what I'm saying is this is a very interesting factoid on top of the fact that it is the first appearance of Eitri and one of the fullest uh, origins of Thor. Additionally, just as a little fun a side note, this is also the book where the story takes place where Th Loki actually cuts the hair of Sif. You can see that in the panels right here. And of course, we know in the Loki show, they made reference to this when he went into his memory flashback of Sif. So I thought that that was pretty fun that they actually pulled this particular plot line from this comic book. All right, moving on to my next sleeper spec book with Swagglehouse here. I have Avengers number 165 from 1977, written by Jim Shooter. And what is the significance of this? Well, this is the first appearance of Henry Gyrick, everybody's favorite evil politician. Henry Gyrick, you guys remember Henry Gyrick. Who are the X-Men fans out there? You remember, it's this guy, this guy who you never see his eyes, who he's always got the glasses on, he's always plotting and brooding against the X-Men or the Avengers or whatever the case may be. And why am I so bullish about this? Well, Henry Gyrick is super important to the Marvel Universe. I mean, he's so important to like, you know, tying in the, the government to superheroes and, and the, you know, anti-superheroes or anti-mutants. I mean, he's involved in so many storylines and whether or not, you know, you grew up in the Bronze Age reading these Avenger books, or you grew up in the 90s watching the X-Men cartoon, or you're even reading the current comic books today. Uh, if you've been reading Immortal Hulk, Henry Gyrick was, you know, involved in that storyline as well. So to me, I feel like Henry Gyrick is a character that they, that the MCU, needs that the MCU probably wants to bring in. I mean, currently, you know, we have General Ross. He, he's sort of like the antagonist uh, a representation of like, you know, the, the, the politicians that don't like uh, superheroes, but they're going to need more than that. You know, if, if Ross goes off and does Thunderbolts and, you know, maybe uh, Julia Louis-Dreyfus character of Contessa, she continues to sort of do her dark thing. Like who's going to be the public facing figure that is also anti-superhero or anti-mutant? I feel like Henry Gyrick is the guy. And I feel like this is a character that is important to the Marvel universe, especially knowing that in the comic books, he actually has a lot of ties to the Thunderbolts as well. You know, he he has connections to them. He has a lot of ties to Sword, who of course was introduced in WandaVision. You know, he's, he has connections to Abigail Brand. So I feel like he's a perfect character to bring into the MCU that can uh, weave through diff different properties and always be like, you know, the thorn in the in the backs of superheroes as it relates to the government. All right, well, let's go on now to my last sleeper spec book here. My last book is going to be Marvel Team Up Annual Number 5 from 1982. And what is the significance of this? Well, again, there's quite a few things here. Number one, it is the first appearance of Atra, creator of the Serpent Crown. We will talk about the Serpent Crown in a second. Number two, it is the first appearance of Frog, Emperor of Lumeria. Of course, he is a deviant. We will also talk about that in a second. Number three, it is the first team up of Doctor Strange, Spider-Man, and Wanda. This is the first time, as far as I can tell, that all three of these characters have teamed up specifically in a comic book together. Also, this is the first seven-headed version of Set. You know, I already talked about Set. Uh, he is a seven-headed snake serpent, or he becomes that, you know, after he is uh, attacked by Demigorge. Uh, this is the first time that, that he we actually see him in that form. And then also, this is written by Mark Effen Gruen Wald. What do you got to say? I've already talked about why I think Mark Ruinwell is important. But why do I think that this storyline is so important? Well, to me, this I feel like is a storyline that is the convergence of a lot of things that they've been setting up in the MCU. For starters, we're talking about a team up of Doctor Strange, Spider-Man, and Scarlet Witch here. We all know that, you know, that Kevin Feige has already talked about the fact that WandaVision and Spider-Man and Doctor Strange 2 all kind of relate to each other in some kind of trilogy, in some kind of way. We know that he's been pulling from Mark Ruinwell's storylines, and this is the book where those three 
actually team up to fight some great evil. Additionally, let's talk about this first appearance of Frog here, Emperor of Lemuria. Now, without to go on a tangent with a whole history lesson, all you need to know is that Lemuria is a, is a city where the Deviants would reside. It was one of their empires a long, long time ago, and Frog was one of their emperors in that specific city. Also, Atra, who also lived in that city, was also a Deviant. He created the Serpent Crown. So now, I don't think that the Marvel is going to like introduce the Serpent Crown. I believe that that might be a story that they save for Nam Namor the Submariner. Uh, if they bring in Namor, Serpent Crown is one of his big storylines with Atlantis attacks. But overall, what to me I feel like they're taking from is the fact that there is this evil entity thing, aka the Darkhold, that was created by some evil power and that Doctor Strange, Spider-Man, and Wanda all have to fight against it. And in this storyline here, they also have references to the fact that you know they're in this multiverse and the evil MacGuffin is communicating with itself in all these different multiverses, forming one giant massive multiverse threat thing. So I feel like they're going to take those story beats from this particular book and apply it to the Darkhold and apply it to the Doctor Strange movie. And for that reason, I think that this book is very, very significant and very interesting overall. Well, that is all I have for this video. Those are my four sleep respect books with Swagglehaus. I know what you're thinking. I've gone full Pepe Sylvia over here, but I think that these are all super, super important books to like Marvel lore and the Marvel Foundation. And I think that there's a lot of ways that these books could pop off knowing the plot lines that we're getting in the MCU. Anyways, drop me a like, comment, subscribe if you're enjoying the content, and I will see you in the next video.